Welcome to Spring Law's 2019 Spring Forward Legal Updates webinar series. This series is designed to provide a comprehensive legal overview of key issues related to employment law and human rights in Ontario. Spring Law is a virtual employment law firm advising on workplace legal issues for employers, employees, freelancers, and executives from a wide range of industries. We hope you enjoyed today's webinar and find it useful and informative. To reach our team, please visit Spring Law at www.springlaw.ca. And now to our presenters. Hi everyone. Welcome to the Spring Forward Legal Update monthly webinars. This is the third of our 2019 monthly webinars and the topic is managing disabilities in the workplace. My name is Marty Baisley and I'm joined by Oren Barbalat. We are both lawyers at Spring Law. And if you're one of our clients, you already know that we're employment and contracts lawyers um, and our virtual law firm is based in Ontario. So we specialize in employment and workplace law and we deal with uh, legal issues in the workplace regularly. If you're new to our law firm community, welcome. For the webinar, feel free to ask questions uh, using the chat function. And if we can't get to your questions during the 30 or so minutes, we'll reach out to you directly. Um, the slides will be provided after the presentation, or they can be downloaded now under the handouts tab. Finally, uh, for more information on our law firm, please, please visit us at springlaw.ca, and you'll see all kinds of great resources there. Um, you'll see our, our uh, weekly blog and our newsletter, and we uh, make a lot of effort to write about um, relevant, timely topics that no doubt if you wear an HR hat or an HR professional, uh, you deal with these kinds of issues regularly. So we, we, we do put a lot of effort into uh, trying to help our clients and prospective clients um, deal with their, their daily challenges in the workplace. You will also see information about our innovative subscription program for employers on the website. And this is a program designed to provide um, budget certainty to small and mid-sized employers in Ontario. Um, so again, if you wear an HR hat at all and don't have the budget to necessarily pick up the phone and call a lawyer every time you have a legal issue or when you need a, a particular legal document, this subscription program is designed for um, organizations like yours. It's, it, we operate based on a flat monthly fee that includes um, the core legal documents and access to lawyers to um, talk about how to implement those documents or answer your discrete legal questions. And the flat fee is based on the size of your organization. So it's a relatively new program for us and we're very excited about it and our friends, so are our clients. Um, our ebook e for employees who've been terminated is also uh, available on the website and we also have an ebook um, a Bill 47 ebook. And just sorry, to back up, the ebook for employees who've been terminated is designed for those who may not um, want to seek uh, specific legal advice from a lawyer, and it's got all kinds of useful information for um, employees who have been terminated. So we recognize that um, those tuning in today are likely uh, employers or those working at an organization where they deal with um, uh, employee, employee issues, um, but we certainly um, advise uh, employees and executives as well as uh, having employer clients. So um, without further ado, let's jump in. I'm going to very quickly uh, run through a presentation roadmap, just so you know where we're going today. Um, I'm going to run through a, a, a fact scenario, a hypothetical fact scenario, which hopefully will um, be helpful to you and, and resonate and, and, and bring up some of the issues that you folks deal with daily, because the, the whole idea of this presentation today is to give you some practical tips when these things come across your, your desk or your computer screen. Warren's going to run through a high-level overview of the law, that uh, the laws that apply when you're managing somebody who has a disability um, in the workplace. And, and I'm going to talk about, and so that will involve human rights laws in Ontario, a discussion of what is a disability, discrimination, and harassment. And then I'm going to dig into the duty to accommodate and um, uh, leave you with some practical tips about um, how to address these very challenging situations. Um, we'll skip back over to Oren, and he's going to talk about undue hardship, that threshold that is quite difficult for employers to meet. Um, and then we'll leave you with a few takeaways. So let's jump into our uh, case study, and I'm going to go through the facts um, of our fellow Joe, uh, who is, is the hypothetical scenario 
Um, he's a controller at ABC East Troughing. ABC East Troughing is going into a very busy period as the snow has melted and the rain is starting to pour, and they are flooded with work and, and extremely busy, and their, their management team is um, ready to roll into spring. So Joe has been absent a number of days in the last three months. Um, he eventually presents a doctor's note requesting a medical leave to his, his boss. There's a significant backlog of work from his absences, um, directly related to his absences, the work's piling up. ABC believes that relationships with their suppliers who are not being paid are in jeopardy. Um, and they've had three part-time temporary employees who are not suitable for the job that come through. And, and the placement agencies that they can't provide ABC um, with what they need uh, unless they advertise for a full-time permanent position. So they're, they're in, a, in a tough spot, and we're going to weave through Joe and ABC's, um, we're going to weave these facts in as we go through the law and the duty to accommodate. So I'm going to uh, hand it over to Warren now, who's going to talk to you um, about the laws that apply in these situations. Great. Thanks so much, Marty. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on our webinar today about managing disabilities in the workplace. I'm going to quickly go over uh, human rights law in Ontario. We're obviously going to be focusing on the Ontario Human Rights Code, which applies to all provincially regulated industries in Ontario. There are two other pieces of legislation you should be aware of as well. We have the Canadian Human Rights Pardon me, the Canadian Human Rights Act, which it largely traces the Ontario Human Rights Code, um, and then you also have the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, as we'll refer to as AOTA, um, which introduces a series of standards the public and private organizations must implement with certain timelines. So with AOTA, it complements the Ontario Human Rights Code. Um, so you do have to comply with both. Complying with one doesn't necessarily mean you're complying with the other one. And the key point with the Ontario Human Rights Code is that, or what we're going to be focusing on today, is that there's no discrimination based on disability and there's no harassment based on disability. And that's in Section 5. Another key point is that employment is, is fairly broadly defined, right? So employment just doesn't only refer to the relationship in the workplace between the employer and the employee. It also refers to job applications, recruitment, training, transfers, promotions, apprenticeships. Um, it really covers the entire process. So you really have to be mindful of um, your rules, your conduct, um, throughout the entirety of the process of engaging in that worker and, um, and, and workplace relationship. So moving on, what is a disability? So disabilities are fairly broadly defined. The Ontario Human Rights Code provides a definition, which we've provided here. It's not exhaustive and it is constantly evolving. So what's become very relevant recently are are mental health issues, right? Things like addiction, drug dependencies, um, drug use for medicinal purposes. These are now all under the ambit, which I'm sure you're aware of, uh, of disability and, and they're things employers need to be constantly mindful of. So moving on, what are discrimination and harassment? Now, discrimination isn't it's not defined in the in the code and really what it comes down to is any kind of differential treatment of someone based on a disability so um, whether a rule policy any kind of employer conduct treats someone differently because they have a disability right and as i mentioned earlier disability is a fairly low threshold um, it's important to note that intent is irrelevant right so um, whether or not you intend to discriminate against someone doesn't really matter, right? So if taking this back to our case study with Joe, let's suppose that Joe, um, in his medical note to the to ABC Co, he says, or his doctor notes that he's got um, a mental health issue. Let's say he has depression and he can't come into work. Now let's say ABC Co has a policy for integrating employees with physical disabilities back into the workplace, right? And they don't have one for integrating employees with mental health disabilities back into the workplace. Arguably here, you know, there's no intent to discriminate against Joe, um, but it, it doesn't matter, right? Because there would still be some kind of adverse treatment. Now, with respect to harassment, 
it is defined and it's defined as engaging in a course of vexatious comment or conduct that is known or a lot reasonably uh, to be known to be unwelcome. And in lawyer speak, we like to call this a subjective and objective element. What this really means is that um, you have to consider the, the position of the person being subjected to the treatment as well, right? So um, going back to Joe, let's say his supervisor, upon learning that Joe is taking a mental health leave, he starts referring to Joe as soft, right? And he sees that Joe is getting upset. So that's the, that would be the objective element. Sorry, that would be the subjective element because Joe's supervisor can see Joe's getting upset. He's not enjoying the behavior and he continues to do it. And so that differential treatment um, would be harassment, even though, um, again, so yeah, that would be harassment because that's, that's an objective element. So the subjective aspect is how does Joe actually uh, perceive the harassment, right? Which is relevant here as well. Pardon me. So the objective component would be how would a reasonable person react, right? And should Joe be getting upset that his boss is calling him soft? Arguably, yes. So moving on, we're going to get into forms of discrimination. As I kind of alluded to earlier, uh, discrimination can, you know, it can have intent, it cannot have intent, and it can take various forms. So it can be direct. So something like an overt job ad. We've seen this in the news lately with Facebook, right? Ads uh, specifically targeting certain groups or not targeting certain groups. Um, that can be more direct, right? So if you, most organizations don't do this anymore, but if you had an ad specifically excluding disabled persons, that would be a direct form of discrimination. Um, a, le a more indirect form of discrimination would be um, having a job ad or, you know, specifically not hiring people who have gaps in the resumes, right? They might not be working because they've been off for, for some kind of uh, health issue. So in that sense, you'd be indirectly treating them differently and therefore that can be an indirect form of discrimination. The Human Rights Code makes it clear that a poisoned work environment is also, is also discrimination. So going back to Joe, let's say his employer, um, while Joe was on a medical leave, starts telling other employees that, hey, um, you know, Joe's pretty soft I, I don't trust him to come back to work. I don't think he's going to do a great job, right? So arguably, his supervisor is creating a poisoned work in, environment in his absence. That would be a form of discrimination. Systemic discrimination is really, um, it's more complex because it can be invisible, right? So these are, this refers to, to systemic issues in society that really perpetuate discrimination. And as far as employers are concerned, um, this could be something that we often talk about, which is, uh, recruitment, specifically AI and recruitment, which is a, a topic we like to talk about pretty frequently. We're actually doing another webinar in, in the near future, which you should tune into. Um, but as a quick example, let's say you outsource your recruitment to a company that uses AI, and now they're only targeting certain groups, right? Let's say they're only targeting white males who are able-bodied, right, between a certain age. So even though you're targeting even though you're not specifically excluding people who are disabled, it would be a systemic form of discrimination by um, having them not see those job ads. So moving on, the duty to accommodate, this is really fundamental to, to what we're talking about here. And once someone has a disability, which Marty will get into, whether or not they disclose it, whether they don't disclose it, once the employer knows or should know that someone has a disability, the duty to accommodate is engaged. Um, and how far you have to go is to the point of undue hardship. So employers might have to change the rules, their procedures, their policies and requirements. And what's important to know here is that there's a substantive and procedural component. The substantive component is, um, did you properly accommodate someone, right? So going back to Joe, um, let's say Joe requests a leave and um, or some kind of other accommodation for his mental health issues. Let's say he needs a change in his work schedule. Marnie's gonna get into the different ways you can accommodate, but really um, the sus substantive component is how much did you accommodate, was it enough? The procedural component is, um, did you even engage in the accommodation process, right? So if Joe presents you with the doctor's note or presents ABC Co with the doctor's note and says, uh, Joe's unable to come into work, for two weeks because he's experiencing stress as a result of his uh, depression, 
and you don't respond or you don't engage with them at all, you don't advise them of his options for STD or LTD or any other disability plan, that, that could potentially be a breach of the code as well. And then picking up on, on our last slide, how, how much do you have to accommodate, right? Um, and really, it's up to the point of undue hardship. So we've laid out the test here. We're not going to get into it in too much detail. But um, really, it's a process of accommodation. There's a continuum of how much you have to accommodate. Marnie's going to get into that. Um, if we look at number one here, this is often this often comes up uh, for for employers who have a certain workplace rule, right? And they they, they treat someone differently. And the question then becomes, is that rule, is it really con connected to an overall purpose that's necessary? Um, if it is, is there like a less intrusive way of applying that rule? And then number three is, can you accommodate up to the point of undue hardship, which uh, we'll get into further. Going back to Joe, let's say as a controller, there's a workplace rule against off-duty conduct specifically that prohibits him from ever being intoxicated off duty, right? Um, let's say Joe, as a result of his depression, has to use some kind of medication uh, that causes him to be impaired off duty, right? So number one would look at, is that policy really necessary? Um, can it be changed? And is there another way for the employer getting to number three to accommodate with undue hardship? So now I'm going to turn on to Marnie who's going to walk you through the accommodation process and, and the different ways employers can accommodate someone who does have a disability. Thanks, Marnie. Okay, so Marnie's given a, um, an overview of the law, and, and I'm going to focus on the practicalities here of the process and, and sort of how we approach things when a client or employer calls us and says, is that a situation? Um, and, you know, they've called us, they know that, that, that there's risk, that there's risk that uh, if they don't handle it properly, um, the employee could claim that they've been discriminated against. And at worst case, they can file an application at the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario. Um, and there's just so much that can be done to avoid uh, getting to that point. Um, nobody wants to be involved in litigation, but also taking steps just to improve workplace relations is, is good for the entire workplace. And I, I feel it's always unfortunate when employers don't um, set the process up and take the steps in advance, um, and and things that things happen that were very unavoidable. So I'm big on um, I'm going to share with you a couple of checklists that I, I share with all my clients, and and it just as a guide, and I think they're very helpful. Um, just when you're getting your ducks in a row, and you've had somebody um, come forward and and ask for a leave or or convey that they have a disability. Um, directly or indirectly, and I'm going to get to that. So the accommodation process, it, it is just that. It's a process. It's not an all or nothing proposition. Um, and it, it's about the person's needs, not what they would like to see happen, and not their preferences. So um, it's about getting to the bottom of what what are their needs, what are their restrictions, what an accommodated um, work situation would look like, what accommodation would look like. And, and I'm going to get into medical documents in a minute, but really, um, the most important uh, thing in my mind is what the medical document says. Um, you know, you're not always going to have a, a document, but as soon as someone's asking for extended periods of time, you're going to want to understand from the doctor what their restrictions are. We are not doctors, nor should we be. Um, at, like, in terms of talking about legal counsel or HR, or anyone internally, that is something that is is best left to the doctor, and we rely on that to advise. Um, a, our clients or for you to take, you should rely on, on the medical documentation when you're figuring out next steps. So rely on those documents to figure out what the person's needs are. And then a very important principle um, in this process is that it is a two-way street. So employers and employees have obligations in this process. Um, and, and I'm going to go through each of the obligations um, in this two-way street uh, as I describe it. So moving on to the next slide. So I'm going to talk about those duties and responsibilities in this process and this two-way street shared responsibility. So I'm going to start with some employee responsibilities. And this is would be page one or slide one of the ch handy checklist I was referring to before. These This content, non-exhaustive, but it's a starting point and it's from the Ontario Human Rights Commission policy, directly from that policy. It's been cited in case law. Um, so it's a great, a great place to start if you're trying to um, take a position where you ultimately might need to um, terminate an employee long way down the road after you've 
uh, approach this situation very cautiously. Following this list will help your decision be defensible. So I highly recommend this as a starting place. So as the employee, they have a responsibility to make their accommodation needs known. Um, they, uh, they need to advise and, uh, of any relevant restrictions or limitations they have and provide that information from their treating um, healthcare practitioner. Um, they need to take part in discussions about possible solutions. So this is a, a entirely a collaborative approach with the employer and there should be an open dialogue through it. And uh, you know, employers need to be sensitive to the fact that depending on the nature of the disability that might be very challenging for someone. So you have as an employer to approach this delicately. Um, communication lines need to remain open, but you have to treat the person with dig dignity and be sensitive to um, what their needs are, not their preferences, their needs. So, you know, contacting them and reaching out to get additional information. Do that, you know, do that respectfully. Don't do it too often. Think about, put yourself in their shoes and think about what, um, you know, a, a real human approach, frankly, but also approach that's going to be defensible if this is scrutinized later by a human rights tribunal. So you're doing this to treat your employees well, but you also have to be careful about um, what this is going to look like if if um, a litigation or a complaint is filed down the road, an application is filed down the road. Um, cooperate, that an employee has to cooperate with any experts, has an obligation to cooperate with any experts whose assistance is required in determining what the accommodation uh, needs are. And the employee needs to meet agreed upon performance standards and requirements um, once the accommodation process is set. Um, so that, that's, that's very important. It's not sort of a carte blanche to be off um, doing what they feel like they can do. Um, they have to collaborate and discuss uh, with the employer what they can and can't do, and there needs to be agreement. So an employer can, can, can plan their business and understand what, uh, what's going, what work's going to be done and what needs to be um, delegated to somebody else, as an example. So let's move on to the employer responsibilities. So in this two-way street, shared responsibility um, uh, mindset, employers need to be alert to the, the possibility that a person uh, may need accommodation even if they haven't uh, made a specific or formal request. So while I said the employee needs to ask for accommodation, uh, this is somewhat of an exception. If, if there's an employee who appears to be struggling um, for any variety of reasons, uh, an employer has a duty to, to find out what's going on. So for example, if you have someone who suddenly missing a lot of work or, you know, having crying uh, spells or just seems despondent at work suddenly and there's something going on with them, an employer has a, a duty to, to ask if they need help um, or if there's, there's some kind of accommodation that they need. And we're always keeping an employee's privacy in mind here. Um, I, I always think this is pretty much a common approach, uh, sorry, a common sense approach. You treat this person um, as a colleague and with as much respect a, as possible. Um, and, and that should apply throughout. Even if you have an employee who, you, you know, in your heart think is probably malingering and taking advantage of the situation, you really have to keep in mind, um, you know, the process and and um, checking off these boxes and making sure you're understanding what is going on. And, and we're going to get to undue hardship and where that line, we, where we can finally say, I've done everything that we we can do. And and then at that point, we would recommend you seek legal advice because. Uh, it gets really tricky at that point. But in your process, make sure that you're you're approaching it um, in a way that you respect the employee uh, and that you try and find out um, the best solution to resolve the problem. So in, in doing so, you're going to accept accommodation approach, uh, requests in good faith um, and, uh, you know, sit down with them um, and, and figure out what action needs to be taken. Have that collaborative um discussion with them and keep records of everything you do in the accommodation process. Um, like just an internal memo, emails, whatever, whatever you do. Um, there's nothing worse than an employer who um, has a, an application filed and then defending that application. They don't have anything to back up the fact that they actually did think outside the box, get creative, figure out how they could help this employee. And they came up with no great options, frankly, but they did have a process, and and it should their process should be defensible. They really had no alternatives, and it would have there would have been undue hardship for them to accommodate. So if they have actually gone through that process but have nothing to show for it, it's always unfortunate, and it, it, it frankly makes the employer look like they've acted in bad faith when they they may in fact not have at all. Um, so and be mindful of, of the content of any internal docu documentation when um, you are documenting the process that you take. 
if you do believe that Joe is a malingerer and he's always off on Fridays and Mondays conveniently and you don't think there's any merit to the disability, keep that conversation, that strategy discussion uh, internal and be very discreet about it. And in your documentation, be sure that um, you know, you're following a process where you're not making prejudgments or predeterminations in emails. Um, and that you're not, you know, and you're not following medical documentation and so on, because um, these kinds of documents would be relevant in a legal proceeding, and they would be producible, and they can be detrimental to defending um, uh, a human rights complaint. Maintain confidentiality. So that goes back to, you know, treating the, the person who's requesting accommodation with respect and dignity. Obviously, this is another common sense um, recommendation. You know, be, be discreet and, and, and discuss with people on a need-to-know basis. Um, and again, consulting with the person I've covered that, be collaborative and, and, and really think uh, creatively about what could be um, done to accommodate this person. And, and rather than saying, no, we're a 20 person organization, there's absolutely nothing that can be done. Really stop, stop yourself and think about what positions might be available, um, where, what roles need to be filled, what projects you, know, you wanted to have done. And this particular person, Joe, has a special skill set, maybe he could fill um, this role temporarily, um, just all kinds of examples. Um, and you may just remember, no, it's actually not going to work. But again, think about it, and you might surprise yourself and figure out there is um, uh, a workable solution. And but if you, but if there isn't, you're you have gone through this process and you're going to report that you've thought about these options. Um, and lastly, bear the cost of, of any required accommodation. The, you know, this is to the point of undue hardship. But um, if if for example, there's some, you know, a, a specific um, or, you know, um, ergonomic aid that's required for this uh, employee that would make a big difference for them. Consider that cost within reason and, and, and all those kinds of related costs that could help the employee um, in the accommodation process. Um, that, that would be um, the employer's obligation to, to really think hard about that and try to bear those costs. Um, moving on, um, medical information. So um, I've mentioned privacy concerns. You know, that's at the forefront of, of uh, this. You have to respect uh, as an employer, if the employee's privacy, but you're balancing that with um, getting enough information to understand what the accommodation needs are the are from the employee. So, I always think it's always unfortunate when um, you're trying to get medical information and what comes back is a one-line chicken scratch note from a doctor that is not helpful, and you have to go through the a process again to book another appointment or have the employee book another appointment and get into their doctor and get more fulsome information. So I think it's very advisable to get ahead of the process and, and tailor your requests for medical information. And we have, um, we do we tailor them regularly based on the person's needs and on what kind of medical professional they're seeing. This might mean a functional abilities form or just a simple, um, a form that sets out um, attaches the job description of the person and sets out the kind of information that you're specifically asking from the doctor because they often don't know exactly what's required in the process. Um, they may not have had these kinds of requests before. So, um, and, and it's always helpful to emphasize at the beginning of um, this request, a letter or form or whatever it is, that you're not seeking personal medical information. Um, you're seeking uh, a prognosis and what information about the person's restrictions. So you're only asking for what's reasonably related to the person's limitation or restriction. And so generally, in most cases, there's no employer right to know this confidential medical information. So you're not asking about the cause of the disability, the diagnosis, symptoms, or treatment. You just want to know what the restrictions are and what you need to do as an employer to try to accommodate them. In some cases, independent medical exams are needed, um, but I would think carefully before you engage in an independent medical uh, assessor. Because first of all, they're expensive, and often what happens is you have two conflicting medical opinions, and you're not a lot further ahead. So, um, I, you know, you can, we can almost do another webinar on this topic, but I, I would just say proceed with caution when you, when you um, consider that route. Thanks, Marty. I'm going to get into undue hardship. So it's kind of the theme we've discussed throughout, and it's really... It's really the end point of the accommodation process. It's the point where the employer says um, accommodation is no longer required. So there, there are only three considerations an employer can properly look at, and those are cost, outside, outside sources of funding, if any, and then health and safety requirements, if any. And so a, a key thing to note here is that 
because the human rights code is really intended to protect people, it's very protective in nature, the, the type of evidence you would require in order to get to the point of undue hardship, it is it does have to be objective, it does have to be significant, and it, it is a very high standard. Another thing to note is that no other considerations could be, are, are really relevant here, right? So besides these three, um, you know, things like business inconvenience, uh, employee morale, or, or just mere sh assertions of of what's actually happening in the work workplace will will often not suffice. So you know, objective evidence could include things like financial statements and budgets, scientific data, information and data resulting from empirical studies, expert opinions, detailed information about the activity and the requested accommodation, or information about the conditions surrounding the activity and their effects on the person or group with a disability. Now I'll get into the specific factors that you may consider. So as mentioned, costs, a very high standard. Uh, they must be quantifiable. They must be shown to be related to the accommodation. And this is the, really the key part here with costs is that they, they must be so substantial that they alter um, the nature of the enterprise and its viability, right? So again, it can't just be that it's expensive and you don't like it. It, it really has to go to the core of your business and affect its viability. Um, going back to Joe, right? Um, let's say Joe requests the leave, um, and it's indefinite. And that could be problematic because his employer might now have to go and hire temporary workers, right? How long does he hire them for? Uh, it, it might be very difficult to get a good quality temp if you're not advertising for a full-time position. There could be adverse effects with clients, suppliers. Uh, it could just generally be really inconvenient for the employer, but really for ABC Co., to, to meet this element of undue hardship cost, they would really have to either have some kind of report, um, something really concrete to show that it really affects the overall viability of, of ABC Co. Now getting into outside sources of funding, that this really just refers to um, an additional source of funding that either the employee or the employer can secure. Uh, th this is interesting because really the, the test of undue hardship, it, it's on the employer to prove, right? So it's the employer's burden, but for this specific element, that there is an obligation on an employee to try and secure other sources of funding, right? So whether that's a government grant, uh, a tax credit, maybe there's another, um, there are other disability benefits available to the employee, really it kind of puts the obligation here on both the employer and in the and the employee to avail themselves of any outside sources of funding. And then finally, health and safety. So with this factor, this one's quite complex because for the employer, you're really balancing your obligation to engage in good faith in the accommodation process while really protecting your other employees, clients, and uh, and the public at large, right? So. If, if there's a health and safety requirement that creates a barrier for the person with the, with a disability, the employer should consider alternatives. Um, but they have to; it has to be kind of an object, objective assessment of the risks. So a few things employers can consider um, are the ultimate costs of uh, of, a, of engaging in the in the health and safety accommodation or, or changing a specific rule. Another thing they would consider is whether the employee themselves is bearing all the risk, right? So let's say the employee works in a, a, a safety sensitive position. Is it just their, their safety that's compromised by changing a rule? Or would you be affecting the safety of other employees or the public at large? And an area this often comes up is, um, you know, employees who operate heavy machinery, employees who uh, operate public transit, and we see the intersection here with rules that prohibit uh, alcohol use, drug use, uh, rules requiring drug testing, and ultimately the question becomes is, um, does this rule, first of all, is it rationally connected to the performance of the job? Um, what are you trying to achieve by the rule, right? So that's kind of the first step in, in the legal duty to accommodate before you can get to undue hardship. But once you get to undue hardship, the question then is, um, do you do you really have no choice here, right? So if we if we come back to Joe, right? Joe is a controller. He's an office worker, and let's say his employer has a rule that uh, 
prohibits any kind of off-duty drug use, right? And Joe, um, you know, let's say he has a prescription for uh, medication for his depression. Let's say it's intoxicating and it, it actually impairs him when he's off-duty, right? Would a, a blanket prohibition on off-duty drug use, um, would that apply here, right? So is there another way for the employer, is there a way really here for the employer to change that rule, right? For someone like Joe, they might, you might be overreaching. It, it would be tough. Whereas if, if Joe was a, um, if he was an operator of a TTC vehicle, then maybe a blanket prohibition on drug use might be more appropriate because um, especially for things like marijuana, it, it, it's tough to see how long it's in someone's system. Is he coming to work impaired? There's obviously, obviously a larger uh, public health safety issue. Um, and so the, the analysis really depends on on the nature of the role and the nature of the rule and how far you can accommodate. So that wraps up most of the content. Some key takeaways, um, disabilities, uh, as mentioned earlier, are very broadly defined and they're evolving. Um, you know, it's not just the obvious back issue or leg issue. Um, they're more complex now, things like addictions. The courts have been clear addictions uh, are disabilities. As Marnie talked about, there's the continuum of accommodation, right? So um, it's not really an all or nothing approach. You kind of have, you can have the graduated return to work. If possible, you can find alter, alternative employment. But as Marnie mentioned, you know, it, it, there's a point. And as I mentioned, there's a point of undue hardship, right? So you're not necessarily required to create a new job for someone. You're not required to have two people working the same job, but you are required to accommodate as much as you can, assuming obviously, you know, there is, uh, there is a legitimate disability at play. And then as Marnie alluded to, the, the shared responsibilities in the accommodation process, right? So once you as the employer engage in good faith, it is a shared responsibility. You, you are permitted to ask for medical information. Obviously, you don't want to go too far. You do want to be mindful of confidentiality issues. Um, you don't want to ask someone to disclose uh, the cause of their disability. But again, you are you, you do have competing interests as an employer, right? You you know you need to accommodate. You also need to protect your other employees in the workplace. So uh, again, there are reasonable requests for medical information. And then getting to undue hardship, it is a high standard, right? Uh, it doesn't mean it's impossible, but if if you want to get down the road of uh, you know if you feel like your company is in a position where you can no longer accommodate. Um, you might want to seek legal advice, right? And again, it is a very high standard and you would want to really paper, paper it so you can uh, have an objective analysis of what the accommodation process entails. So that, that concludes today's webinar. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, we do this every month. In our next webinar, uh, we're going to be talking about, about startups and freelancers, and that's on May 15th. And we hope that you'll join us then. Thank you very much.